But today, today I want to uh, talk to you about forgiveness. Forgiveness. That's kind of a hard thing sometimes. It's hard. But you know, we know that we serve a holy God, a holy, forgiving God. Now, we can go back into the Old Testament. We can go back into Genesis. And we can see where God forgave Adam and Eve from their sins. And we also can go back and see where uh, God forgave the nation of Israel, as they wandered in the desert, their sins. But I want to bring up something before we get going very far into this about forgiveness. This is something that's important. There is forgiveness, but there's also consequences for our sins. You know, as, as a young man growing up, my father and mother loved me dearly. And they forgave me of my disobedience. But that doesn't mean that I had to face the consequences of my actions or lack thereof. The more I thought about it, I really didn't face them. I kind of turned my backside to them. And that was the consequences. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so... Before I look at our focal scripture today, I want us to think about three different types of forgiveness. And all of these types of forgiveness are interrelated. Uh, they're dependent upon one another. The first one, obviously, is the forgiveness that we receive from our holy God. Now, we know that scripture tells us that the penalty of our sin is death. And so God made a way for us by sending His one and only Son, His precious Son, Jesus Christ, to be the sacrificial Lamb for each of us and for our sins. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son that whosoever would believe in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, Understand this, God did not wait until we were worthy of His forgiveness. Romans 5.8 assures us that God showed His love for us and that while, while we were still sinners, while we were still in our sin, Christ died for us. Now God offered His precious sinless Son, Jesus Christ, as our sacrificial Lamb, while we were still sinners. I found a quote that I've, I've had, and, and uh, I don't even remember who, who said this, uh, so I'm going to declare it as the author unknown. But it says this, psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment, feelings of vengeance towards a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. Now this brings us to our main scripture this morning. I'm going to read this scripture, but I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to, I'm going to read it for you, and then we're going to come back to it here in just a moment. And this is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And this is what it says. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away. He has nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, I said that there's three types of forgiveness, and they're all interrelated, but they, they all follow and are based on the first forgiveness, and that is 
God's forgiveness of us. The second forgiveness we have is the forgiveness that we extend to one another and that we may receive from one another. Now, this includes our family, our friends, our co-workers, and our enemies. If it wasn't for the forgiveness of God that we received through Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, we would not be able to love and forgive others as we should. So it is the love, and it is because we love, because God first loved us. And likewise, we forgive because He first forgave us. We're not to examine the other person or, or the situation and see if it's worthy of our love and our forgiveness. If God did this to us, we would be bound for hell. As none of us are worthy. None of us are worthy of His love, His sacrifice, and His forgiveness. Romans 3.10 tells us that none are worthy. Not one. Not one is right. So no one in this building is worthy of what He has given us. No one outside of this building is worthy of His forgiveness. So think about this. God paved the way for our forgiveness before we were worthy or asked for forgiveness. So are we to be haughty or prideful that we will not forgive someone till they cower to us and beg us for their forgiveness? Absolutely not. Likewise, if we have transgressed we have offended or we have hurt someone, we should be quick with our genuine apology and not slow to ask for forgiveness. As I said a while ago, we love because He first loved us. That comes from 1 John 4, 19 through 21. It says, we love because He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. God's forgiveness of our trespasses and our sin paves the way for our forgiving of others can't have one without the other. And it's almost like a link of a chain. we got the first link, which is God's forgiveness for us. And then attached to that link is the link of the chain that for us to forgive other people. And it is that first link that strengthens and holds this chain together. And the third link, which is the third forgiveness, which is very important, that attaches to that, supported by God's forgiveness, is the forgiveness of ourselves. You know, self-forgiveness is a difficult thing sometimes. This enables us to release ourselves from our guilt and our perfectionism. And this, I will confess to you, is an area that I struggle in. Sometimes I have trouble forgiving myself. But as I did this study, I see how foolish I was. Because <laughs> I can ask you this. That you consider two things when you think about forgiving yourself. that will kind of open your eye. The first thing is, whose image are we made? We're made in God's image. He knew us before we were born. He knew us while we were still in our mother's womb. He also knows the number of hairs on our head or that used to be on our head. So how can we not forgive something that was created in God's image? That's who we are. We were created in God's image. You were created in God's image. We need to forgive. And the second thing we need to look at is that if we are worthy of Christ going to the cross of Calvary to sacrifice Himself for us, 
we are worthy of honoring God's forgiveness for us by forgiving ourselves. If God is willing to give His only Son for us, we better be forgiving ourselves. Let's look again at our main verse, Colossians 2, 13 and 15, through 15, excuse me. I'll read it one more time. It says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it all away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So let's think about this. Let's look at verse 13. He says, When we were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision, condemned men are often referred to as dead man walking in death row. So that's what we can consider ourselves before Jesus went to the cross. But verse 13 goes on to say that God made us alive with Christ. I want to shout right there. <laughs> we were dead men and dead women walking, but this verse says that He forgave us our sins and He made us alive with Jesus Christ. And verse 13 goes on to say He forgave us all of our sin. He didn't forgive us of every other sin. He did not forgive us of some sins. It specifically says A-L-L, -L, which means all. He forgave us all of our sins. And He goes on in verse 14, He says, Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away and nailing it to the cross. That legal indebtedness, which stood against us, is a warrant. It was a warrant for our death. that We had to pay by giving of, of, of our life. But that, that warrant's been removed. God canceled the charge of legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. All of our sins are forgiven. The slate is wiped clean. That old arrest warrant was canceled. And you know what he did with it? He nailed it to the cross of Calvary. Now that sounds nice. Sounds pleasant. That our warrant has been nailed to the cross. But we've got to think it wasn't just a piece of paper. It wasn't a piece of paper that said, looked at our sin, that was nailed to the cross. It was his precious son, whose hands and feet were nailed to the cross for us. That cross became the altar of our sacrificial lamb. That precious Lamb of Jesus, who knew no sin, became our sin. And it is because of this that God counseled that legal indebtedness towards us. All of our sins were forgiven. And that is the power of godly forgiveness. But it gets better. In verse 15 there, he says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You know what he's talking about? He took away the powers of Satan. He took away the powers of Satan to accuse us of our sins and our past. Read that to you one more time. And he says, having, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. Satan no longer can do anything 
about what our past is because our past is forgiving. And he triumphed over them by the cross of Calvary. And so Satan can no longer accuse us of our sins or our past. He can never come back to me and say, Chris, remember when you were in high school, what you did there? Remember when you were in college, this thing here that you did? Or remember as you began your, your work career, what happened? Remember when, I, when God called you into the ministry and you did this? Nor can he say, Chris, remember yesterday? My sins are forgiven. And I would challenge you, do not allow your thoughts to be controlled by the prince of all lies. God is true. And Satan is a liar. He will try to do everything in his power to manipulate you. Go and, and make you think of things and, and, and cause you to doubt. Do not doubt. God is true. Don't listen to, don't listen to, to, the, to the, the prince of this world who wants to tell you things about yourself that are not true. And you understand that he's going to manipulate and use other things too. He's going to use the media. He's going to not just speak to you and whisper in your ear. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's going to speak through you through the media and he's going to try to teach you and tell you things that are not true. There is only one truth. There is only one truth, and this is the truth that God has given us to help us walk in forgiveness. Second Corinthians, now there's, there's another verse here that I'm going to read for you that, that shares the same thing. Second Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive. In other words, our sins have been forgiven. I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Verse 11 is key here. In order that Satan may not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his scheme. God did not hide our victory at Calvary. God openly displayed to the world Christ's triumph at the cross where our sins were all taken away and forgiveness serves as one of the most powerful aspects of being a believer in Jesus Christ. Not only the, the forgiveness that we receive from our holy God, but also the example of forgiveness that we can give to other people. You remember that scripture I just read, it says he loved, that we love because he first loved us. And then I said we forgive because he first forgave us. Remember this, scripture tells us that we are to be his light in the community. <coughs> Excuse me. We're also to be his forgiveness in the community. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we received a new life for eternity while also experiencing a new quality of life today. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So God's forgiveness not only means freedom from the eternal punishment of our sin. It means that we can have a living relationship with God right now. We all know that the obvious symptoms that could be relieved by forgiveness, we feel so wounded that we want to take revenge. We have the constant brooding and, and woe is me over this long list of petty grievances. And then the feeling that we feel of guilt. We feel so guilty 
And we don't know how to approach anyone that we may have offended. And we worry that that hurt from someone else could happen again. I didn't, didn't experience that. He sent Jesus to the cross. Knowing that we are not perfect. Knowing that we're going to fail again. Knowing that we are sinful people. But that forgiveness, that forgiveness is, is eternal. He tells us that if we would confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. So I would encourage you, for bitterness and stubbornness can also be signs that forgiveness is called for, especially when, when attitudes are associated with a need to be recognized as the one who is right. You ever get in situations where you say, well, I'm going to be right. I've got to be right. No, don't, don't go that route. So in contrast to these limiting behaviors, which, which usually erect walls between ourselves and others, we can also allow to erect a wall between us and God. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But if we have sin in our life that we continue to participate in, we're not allowing that forgiveness to take place. And so consequently, we are, we are putting that wall between us. It doesn't affect our relationship in that we are lost when we make mistakes, but it does affect our fellowship as our loving walk with Him. Forgiveness enables us to be reconciled with our holy God, our family, our friends, and our neighbors. And forgiveness is free. You know, I said a while ago that in forgiving ourselves, we need to remember that we are created in His image. Uh, last week, I, I had to go out of town, and um, I was coming through uh, a small town, and uh, there was a side road that had a stop sign. And as I was, was approaching going straight, I didn't have to stop. A large truck pulled out in front of me. In, in enough distance, it was not a problem so that, that, that he could go on. And be, before I got to the back of it, a truck, pickup truck, ran the stop sign and cut in behind him. And I had to slam on brakes. And he looks at his side mirror of this big truck, and he gives me a single finger wave. And I thought, you're made in God's life. You're made in God's likeness. I want to encourage you to remember that. Remember that. When someone offends you, someone cuts you off on the road, someone acts like an animal, someone in the grocery store does something. I mean, there we come and cross people all the time. Remember, we are created in His likeness. And we need to act like it. It's, it's not one that I, and this is where I have to stop myself. Because I would, I would love to get back. I would love, love to, you know, have been. But that's not who God is. A God within me. You know? So remember... that we are made in God's image, that we should forgive as well. Last verse for you is Galatians 5.1. says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery, and that is unforgiveness. We sang the song today, 
I stand, I stand in all of you. And I thought of this verse. I stand firm in all of you. I stand firmly planted in your word, on your word, in your forgiveness, in your salvation. I firmly stand in all of you. <clears throat> so do not be burdened and bound to unforgiveness. My prayer is that you live free. Embrace your forgiveness. Extend your forgiveness to others, including yourself. Forgive yourself. Let's pray. Most Heavenly Father, God, I love you, I praise you, I exalt you. I thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you sent your precious Holy Son, Jesus Christ, to come and die on the cross of Calvary for us. I apologize for my sake and for my participation in causing that to take place. But I am so grateful that you love me in spite of my sins and that you sent Jesus not only to come and die on the cross for us, but also to come and live on earth. God incarnate in human form as he taught us scripture. He taught us about you. He taught us about your love for us. He taught us how to worship you and how to bless you with our lives. And he also taught us about how you prepared a place for us and the heaven that awaits us in eternity. I praise you. I thank you. I exalt you. And I pray that you would help us to remember that we are created in your image and that we would be cautious of how we respond to people and the foolishness that is thrown to us sometimes, Lord. And I pray that we will not listen to the lies of Satan and know that you have forgiven us, you have cleansed us of all our unrighteousness. In your precious, sweet, holy name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.